Today we're going to be talking about the arts and culture benchmark that you're participating in. This is our April 20, 2023 update. Um, and just to get us kicked off, I like to start with a data point that has caught my attention to get us going. I know you all are thinking about this, but a question for you all, uh, put this in the chat. Um, are our audiences getting younger, especially as you think about opening back up again and you know we've all are getting into rhythms that we I think are feeling comfortable back with again. Uh, our doors are open, concerts happening. Are we noticing? that our audiences are getting younger or not? What do we think since we've come back from the pandemic? Um, what does that look like? Yeah, so put that in the chat. I'll give it a second for you to uh, uh, contemplate that for a second. But yes, we are. We have a, a, an exclamation point yes uh, coming into the chat. Let's see any others that are that may uh, weigh in here. Are our audiences, are our attendees getting younger? Maybe we don't know yet. If, you know, it's hard to guess, especially if we're not tracking that data. So with that in mind, I love having a data point around this. So in the benchmark, we are tracking um, demographics that we are sharing. Uh, you don't see it on your screen, but we're sharing it in, in research studies we're doing on the back end about what's going on in the benchmark tool. So of the North American organizations who are participating in the benchmark, there's about 150 of them. Uh, we're looking at the percentage of the databases comparing 2019, uh, this was through 2022, and what the difference was from a generational makeup between databases between 2019 and 2022. And you see here among those 150 organizations, symphonies, operas, theaters, dance companies, the wide range, the gamut of performing arts, what the differences look like. And there's this sort of a uh, line that we can draw between 60 and over and 60 and below. And actually we've lost larger percentages of our older audiences. They haven't come back, people who used to, who haven't shown back again, versus newer, younger audiences, much smaller loss of audiences. Gen Z you see here down 6%, millennials down 10%, uh, Gen Xers down 31%, but none of them as extreme as what we've lost on the older side of things at 60 plus. So like I said, this is writ large performing arts um, sector as a whole from 2019 versus 2022. So what does this look like in the orchestra sector? Is it the same? Are there any differences? Well, again, 2019 versus 2022 on the orchestra side, we actually are seeing growth in Gen Zers, millennials, Gen Xers, so that 37% growth in households uh, from Gen Z who re were you know, being represented in 2019 to where we were ended in 2022. So pretty exciting. So those of you who are thinking, I think maybe our audiences are getting younger or they feels that way, we have some data to show that as a sector of the folks who are participating in our benchmark, we're actually seeing that. So really exciting. I call these sometimes the spoonfuls of confidence as we uh, get back into um, our normal or whatever we want to call normal ways of operating right now. But it's exciting to see all this, the work that you all are doing to reach out to new audiences is paying off. So uh, some exciting ways to start our conversation today. So put in the chat, surprised by this, excited by it, what does this make you feel as we uh, Go through further data. So, what are we going to do today? We're uh, welcome. Get to uh, you know, see who's all here. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the overview of our partnership with the league and with you all around our arts, arts and culture benchmark. Do a bit of a data dive. Uh, we are huge data geeks at TRG, so we're going to firmly put our data hat on and talk about some data, and then hopefully have some time for discussion and whatnot to go in to you know have a little more dialogue around what we're seeing within the data. So our arts and culture benchmark, as you probably know, or in case you didn't, we started this early on in the pandemic to start um, articulating the impact of COVID on ticket sales and donations. So giving us all the tool in the sector to be able to articulate that back and understand what, you know, what that meant to our revenues and our budgets as organizations. 
And since that began, which was uh, about April, May of 2020, so early on in the pandemic, we started it. It has morphed and evolved from there to uh, have more insights and going from a tool to um, you know, articulate uh, impact to really thinking about recovery and giving us information to build our strategies as we go forward. So thank you all for participating. And as you probably know, it's a free tool. We get data from you, from everyone who's participating on a daily basis. So um, what the partnership looks like now and where the benchmark is, there's about 400 organizations internationally participating in the benchmark, UK, Ireland, US, Canada, like you heard me say, about 150 organizations in North America. This is a breakdown of organizations by genre who are participating. There's about 36 orchestras who are um, in the mix, representing about 26% of the data set. And for today's data, we're going to be looking both at North America data as well as the aggregate data from these 36 organizations from you all out there. Um, and it represents about 130 million transactions in North America. So a lot of data, a lot of strong sense of trend that we're looking at. And this partnership that we have with the league does a few things. One, uh, we're committed to sharing insights about what's going on with orchestras, as well as comparatively to the uh, um, all the participants as a whole. So. Things like today, sharing some data insights and making that available to you as a, a follow-up, helping to inspire and fuel recovery. We've heard great feedback from organizations saying this data has um, got us thinking in new ways or it has us uh, understanding who's coming back better so we can more effectively budget, build messaging, all of that great stuff. And for this year, for 2023, we are building quarterly connections with you all as participants through partnership with the league. This uh, webinar is our first in this um, ongoing process this year where, where we will be sharing this kind of information. Think about another update at conference, um, then uh, end of summer, early fall, and then um, you know as we're getting into holiday and the end of the year. And again, as it says here, sharing that information back with you. Every time you get one of these decks or one of these sharings, you will get my contact information. I'm doing the research in the back end and uh, hopefully positioning and putting this uh, in a way that's easy to digest and understand, but you'll also get my contact information. So I'm always happy to address questions that you have and or talk further about what you're seeing either in your individual data or in any of the information that we're sharing. So before we jump into data, I, I'm, it's not lost on me that maybe some of you haven't logged in or aren't looking at the benchmark on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought, let's just give you a quick tour of what it looks like uh, just to build that familiarity further and uh, go from there. So I'm gonna stop my share for a moment and go into um, the actual live version of the benchmark. Uh, so you can take a look at that. So that gives me just a second. And I'm gonna log in and then Share this with you all. Great, just pulling it up. Also a good indicator for me to let me know days that my internet is either working quickly or not, uh, but I'm gonna pull this up here. So I'm gonna pull a theater up. So we have both this relationship with the orchestra sector, but also a similar one in the theater world where we are viewing the data by genres. So I didn't want to put any of your specific data up in case uh, you know uh, you wanted to keep that you know data-wise personal. And that makes sense. So I thought I'd pull up a theater just so you could see what um, this looks like when you log into it. And again, some of you may be logging in or be seeing it. Um, I won't take too much time here, but want to give you all just a quick orientation. This is a login you get for participating. You could have as many of them as you want in your organization. Again, it's all free that way. But a couple of things you'll notice as you log in um, is your data will be shown always in the yellow. And this particular dashboard, this is our splash screen that you log into. Your data for the last 30 days uh, revenue-wise is shown right up top. This is ticket revenue. So you can see that this particular organization 
brought in $476,000 over those last 30 days in revenue compared to the average of everyone else in the benchmark who will always be the blue color. So you, your in, uh, individual organization is bold. The benchmark data, which is the group you're comparing against here, we're looking at theaters, but in yours, you would see music. Um, so you can say, hey, are we ahead behind? What does it look like in terms of others uh, who are like our organization? And you get that sense of things. So here, we're, um, your data versus the benchmark, you're 103% ahead. Exciting stuff there. You also see things like advanced revenue. So ticket sales you have into the future. You can also look at how your subscription revenue is comparing to others and how your donation revenue is comparing to others. So if we were to, let's say, click on donation, you see these dashboard indications further beyond that. So you can click and it takes you to a new screen. And we can see here for this particular organization that to date, um, this organization has generated gifts from 719 patrons compared to the same period of time in 2019. So they're actually down 7%. Uh, they can see how many average gifts per patron. So it's very close to pre-pandemic levels, 1.1 to 1.1 uh, total donations. So uh, you have households and then you've got number of uh, individual gifts coming in, how much revenue has been received. So this year, 736,000 versus 2.2 million in 2019. So comparing to see you know, how far off you are from that. So interesting ways to slice and dice the data further. You also get things like how many big gifts versus pre-pandemic major, uh, you know, large, very large, all that kind of stuff. It slices and dices it for you there as well. So every time you click on a new screen, it gives you some new insight. I'm going to go back to our key metrics here. So this is key metrics, get you back to the starting place, get you this top line, to just view in. And each of these bold bars gives you a chance to drill down a little further. So I'm going to tap into one more, and then we'll get back into the data just to keep us on target. But one of the favorite ones we like to look at is audience typology. So we look at your ticket buyers by segmentation. So we have acquisition new buyers, we have current customers once befores, convertees, people who've been two plus times, actives, people who've been here three plus times, super actives, 10 plus, stale, people who haven't been here in 18 months, people who haven't been in uh, three years or more. If you always want to get those definitions, you can click here and that tells you that so you can pull up a list that gives you all that background information so it keeps that clarity for you. And here again, this particular organization you're looking at is the gold, and then you compare it back to the blue. So this particular organization is doing really well aggregate wise getting new buyers in the door about the same as everybody else. They're also overperforming in terms of super active. So the gold bar here is above the blue line, which represents the benchmark. So you could say, oh, great, we're reactivating people really nicely, but isn't doing as well with getting lapsed folks back in the door. So if you were to look at this, you might think, oh, we need to invest a little more in those folks. So perhaps we would have you know, a marketing effort to those folks to try to get those uh, the response rates up higher from this particular group because everyone else in the data set is seeing some strength there. So. A uh, couple of quick things. I know that was sort of on a fast forward, but I want to keep us on target with time. But like I said, you'll get my contact information. If you ever want an orientation to this or dig into it, uh, feel free to give me, shoot me an email and we can book some time to go through that together. I know many of you probably looked at it, but just wanted to give that uh, top line view again. Okay, so data-wise, what are we seeing um, aggregate-wise? both in North America, as well as in the symphony sector as a whole, those 36 participating organizations. So let's go into some insight and some research here. So let's start with ticket sales. So this is actually some data we shared at midwinter. So some of you may have seen it, but it sets the table for our discussion. But if we again look at 2019 versus 2022, this is ticket sales in North, all those North American organizations as a whole. So those 150, comparing 2019 to 2022, revenue down 17%, and units, number of tickets, 
down 24%. So starting place for us as you know, where we were as 22 wrapped up. In the orchestra sector, for that same period of time, we had one of those spoonfuls of confidence. Revenue actually up 2% in 2022 versus 2019. Units were still down 17%. But what we're seeing is we may not have as many people as 2019 purchasing tickets, but they're buying at a higher per capita revenue amount. They're buying more expensive tickets. So this, I think, left a lot of people who saw this at midwinter sort of on a nice high to think we were heading in a strong, good direction. And when we look at that same data on a month by month basis, trying to understand perhaps where, where could we glean or um, unearth the driver behind that, we decided to look at this data on a month by month basis. So you saw you can do that with the tool as well. So orientation here, blue bar is 2019 revenue, purple bar is 2022 revenue, yellow line is 2019 uh, number of tickets, and the green line is 2022 number of tickets. So actually we had some strength starting to emerge 2022 in orchestras in April of last year, um, held for May, a little bit of softening in the summer, but essentially as seasons opened August into September, we were riding on a wave of strength above 2019. And in particular, look what happened in November. There was, as you probably many of you experienced, this pent up interest in holiday programming. So as we got out of October, as Mariah Carey always comes at the end of Halloween with her pumpkin to smash it and say, it's time to start playing. All I want for Christmas is you. That pent up demand started showing up and we saw really strong ticket sales in November for holiday programming and had a good December as well. So good halo uh, to end the year. So where has that translated now that we're uh, three months into the year. And I will say you all are the first to see this. This is literally hot off the press data that I'm about to show. So this is doing a six month comparison, um, October through March. So this is all 2019 as the comparison. So October through December of 2019, as well as January through March of 2019. I didn't do 2020 because it started to get soft and weird once uh, March happens. So we're looking at all 2019 months as a comparison but just those six months within that, compared to the last six months we've been in as a sector. So performing arts in general, revenue down just 5% over six months and units down 17. So actually gaining some strength from where we were uh, looking at that end of year information. But when we look at this on the orchestra sector, we've actually seen some retrenchment happen. So you saw we were ahead before, and now we're actually down 14% revenue-wise in that six-month comparison and units down 22%. So I'm going to toggle back up here. Remember, we were up to and down 17. And now we're down 14 and uh, down 22%. And what does that look like on a month-by-month -month basis? Remember, same orientation, same color charts for us. Um, that strength you saw end of year, October through December, those purple bars doing pretty well. But then really some softening in ticket sales in orchestras since the new year. So look at what happened January, look what happened February, look what happened in March. Uh, so thoughts, ideas, anything you want to put in the chat to think, say, hey, is that what you're experiencing as well? Or any reasons why? you think that might be happening? Any drivers from that? I'll just give a second if anyone wants to weigh in with some thoughts and ideas around why that's taking place. Or if this is ex what you're experiencing as well. Kate, I see you're coming um, off mute. So yeah, you yeah. might want to jump in there, yeah. One of the things you all remember, this includes both single tickets and subscription tickets. This is all ticket units. So I know for some of my own clients, when we launch subscriptions for the coming season in this post-pandemic universe isn't always the same 
as what we were doing in the, the pre-pandemic universe for a host of reasons, right? Some of them really good reasons. I know it's been more difficult with visas and reschedules and, and put it, trying to schedule people we had commitments to into our upcoming seasons. It seems like scheduling for artistic colleagues has just gotten, who knew it could get crazier uh, than it already was. So I, I would acknowledge here, if, if that's you, if you're launching later than you may have in the past, say back in 2019, uh, in January, February, March, if you had subscriptions on sale and you're, you didn't get them on sale this year, that can have a big impact on what you're seeing in terms of tickets and revenue. It could also be impacting your, your donation colleagues, right? Because we know there's many subscribers who donate with those subscriptions. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at these and, and that could be throwing off your patterns and that might mean you actually have a lot more work to to make up ground coming for you here in in spring and summer you all know that i don't have to tell you that but um it's something really important to think about yeah kate that's such a great point and with i was actually just having a conversation with an organization earlier this week uh puzzling through a leap of faith renewal wondering mm -hmm. should we get that out the door or our patrons really do they need to know that programming in order to buy and so we had a really good robust conversation about that and what we're saying i think is those leap of faith renewals um can work really well and especially your nearest and dearest they have a feeling of confidence already around all the great work that you do so if you're still puzzling through programming or wanting to get you know certain pieces of information all lined up um, that's important to do, absolutely, but it might not be crucial to get out with your first couple of communications. It also nicely actually gives you another reason to go back to those folks to say, hey, we now know this, so um, this is a really purposeful and useful um, piece of data for you to get a, a good communication. So some of the ways, some of the things to think about that way. Okay, so I'm going to keep us moving on. Um, so. The other piece of the puzzle we look at related to this sort of aligns itself with consumer confidence is average ticket price. So when ticket prices start to wilt or fall off, that often can be a message back from your patrons saying, um, my, uh, my revenue belt is getting tighter, my, I'm pulling back on things. I still want to prioritize you, but I am making a choice to perhaps buy a less expensive ticket to manage my finances in a new way, or I'm fearful about something. So it's good to put your ear to the, the, the ground on what ticket price is telling you. So this is again, 2019 versus 2022, Performing Arts, and Arts Organizations in North America. This is what happened at the, as we were looking back end of year. Blue line here, 2022, uh, yellow line here, 2019. And we see that Pretty consistently in the sector as a whole, we stayed not just skated above where we were in 2019. So some confidence, a little bit of softening as we got towards the later half of the year, as perhaps the stock market wasn't doing as well, or some of that, you know, retrenchment a tad bit, but not really. In the orchestra sector, really strong. We were actually all of last year really nicely above what our numbers were in 2019. And you saw it out in the revenue and units numbers. Like we were up higher uh, revenue wise, a little bit lower in units, which meant we were bought, we were selling higher price tickets uh, across the board. So where are we now in this last six month comparison? So um, as you see here, slightly different color scheme. Uh, Pre-pandemic is in um, the green, uh, the blue is the last six months for the, the uh, sector as a whole first. So what's going on in North America from those 150 arts organizations? Still some strength across the board. We've stayed above, which is really great. But in the orchestra sector, you're probably not going to be surprised to see this because of what we saw in the last few slides. We've seen average ticket price, especially January, February, start to dip down. Now, to Kate's point, is that price resistance to single ticket prices, or is that because we haven't had subscriptions on sale at, for some organizations at this moment in time? 
and that's pulling our averages down. So that's, um, I call them the starting Mondays, but things you can do back as you get back to your desk. Um, maybe you'll do it later today, but it'll be towards the end of the day. You may want to start getting into weekend mode. But on Monday, look into are your single tickets for this year in particular, since the start of 2023, have they started to soften? And where is that programmatically driven? Is that segmentation driven? If where that softening might be happening, where is that taking place? And that's where you can, you know, you all have many of you such great strong box office teams when you have them, lean into them, get some phone calls out there, some surveying. If you're seeing any softening from segments, start asking the question and trying to be helpful to understand what are some of the drivers and the whys behind that. Kate, I'll pause for a second. You had such good insight about subscriptions. Another, any others you would uh, bring to the table here about why this might be down a little bit, though we see March kind of creeping back up again, which might be some subs going on soon. Yeah, I think one of the biggest trends I've observed with uh, with my clients is that we are not seeing price resistance on high demand programming. So POPs programming has largely, both in terms of volume of ticket buying and prices, rebounded and in many cases exceeding what, what the kinds of volume we were seeing pre-pandemic for those types of programs. High demand classical programming, and you all know, you all know the difference. We're not going to throw anybody under the bus here, any of our composers. But um, those performances are seeing high demand and we're not seeing price resistance, you all. So I just, I know... There's lots of economic concerns out there um, and we wanna be sensitive and attentive to them. And there may certainly be segments of your audience who, who might be feeling the pinch on their budget. So do look at segmentation as a piece of that. And that could be ticket buying segmentation, that could be age or income segmentation as you think about demographic tools. Um, particularly those of you who have access to data center, you've got demographic tools there that you could use to help you filter and segment. Um, but I just wanna to say to you all, we are not seeing evidence in widespread ways that there is uh, price resistance from ticket buyers in any, any meaningful way outside of something like Elliott Carter Fest. And we all know Elliott Carter Fest is, is its own challenge. Um, where we're hearing economic resistance is largely on the fundraising side and it's connected to donor advised funds and stock market-based giving, which makes all kinds of sense when you think about the stock market. So I just, while we are seeing this in the data and I know sometimes our first instinct when the market is tough is to go, oh my God, we have price resistance. We're, and we just raised prices for next year. What did we do? Um, just be really careful. Look at what kinds of programming you had in January and February. Is it just that we had programming in January that we knew was gonna be tougher? Did we have a lot of unexpected snowstorms? Those can do things to our demand levels that have nothing to do with pricing and everything to do with um, what the demand was gonna be or what the weather did to us. And not and and not what's related to programming. So just be careful that you're look. I guess that would be my point. Be careful that you're looking at the data, and letting that dictate whether you see price resistance. Not not our emotions from watching too much twenty four hour news. Indeed, excellent. Thanks, Kate. Again, so helpful. So that sort of gets us into donations. You set the table for us so well. Did you see this presentation ahead of time to? Uh, Crystal ball that for us, I love it. Just on the same plane. Yeah, right, indeed. Um, okay, so donation-wise, same structure that we're gonna look at here, starting off with what how the year ended, 2022 versus 2019, starting with North America first, those 150 organizations. Revenue down 25% and number of gifts down 12%. And this was actually a loss of ground from 2021. If we were to hop in a time machine and look at the, this uh, 2021 versus 2019, these numbers would have been cut in half and actually revenue would have been ahead of where we were in 2019. By many of you experienced this, people stepped up, our donors said, we want you to stay around. We're gonna up our, our giving from what we historically do. What's scary though, is we're not only seeing people retrenching uh, average gift sizes, but sort of sitting out 
a season or two from that really excited participation that they did and then um, not showing up. It could be they said, well, I, I increased, so maybe I gave for the last, for the next two years instead of whatnot. But uh, as we know, people who get out of participating have a harder time getting back into participating. So an interesting something that's going on here. Again, end of the year for um, orchestras, 2022 versus 2019, uh, revenue down 32%, units down 9%. So again, going back in that uh, loss of ground direction that was um, across the board for everybody. So what, uh, what drove that? Where do we see months start to soften? Again, same thing. Blue here is revenue for 2019. Purple is revenue for 2022. Yellow line here is number of gifts 2019. Green line is number of gifts of 2022. And you see things here, especially like end of fiscal year for many of you, softening. And then end of calendar year, December was a struggle to get the level of giving that we would normally expect to have happen. Look how different the blue bar is versus the purple bar. So where are we now in the last six months? Again, um, October through March. Uh, this is performing arts organizations as a whole. Revenue down 38%, number of gifts 14. So bring that back up. We were at negative 25 at the end of the year, negative 12 in terms of units. So now we're at negative 38, negative 14. So actually that unfortunate trend is continuing as we get into the new year. And then on the orchestra side, Revenue down 46% in the last six months and units down 18%. So again, comparing that 32 to nine end of year, now we're down to 46, 810. So some actual acceleration of loss, which uh, could be if you haven't launched renewals yet, as we talked about earlier, those add-on gifts usually make a big difference at that time. So let's look at what's been going on from a month by month perspective. Nothing as low as what we saw in November and December of loss of ground in the orchestra sector, but look at consistency though of January, February, and March. So um, that would be again, some surveys there thinking about what is the value proposition of giving at this moment in time. One of the really wonderful things we saw during the pandemic was folks saying, I'm going to give it again because I see how innovative you're being as an orchestra, and I like that um, change that you're taking on. How can we continue to have those innovation stories get out there? How do they feel as connected as possible with you all? Um, so the other thing then is that average donor amount. So same level of sort of confidence consumer-wise, 2019 versus 2022. A uh, yellow line here, 2019, blue 2022. So we were flirting with ups and downs throughout the whole year sector as a whole. Orchestras mostly behind 2019 and 2019 in terms of average gift amounts, and in particular, what we did not capitalize on the growth we would have expected end of uh, fiscal year for many folks. Um, and then to bring it to the last six months. Um, 2019 versus October through March. Pre-pandemic was is the green line here. The last six months is uh, the blue line. Uh, so we have been fairly consistently, in some cases significantly so, behind average gift amounts over the last six months compared to that same comparative point in 2019. Again, probably not a surprise because of the writ large numbers that we're all looking at, but some interesting uh, ideas this might spark and or ahas. Would love it in the chat if folks have been leaning, A, are you all leaning into this? And B, what um, what are you hearing from some of your patrons as Kate queued up? You know, the stock market has not been as much of a friend uh, to us over the last, you know, end of six months or so. So that is definitely changing some perspectives for folks. Um, but our, our patrons are usual major donors and those level folks, even with some softening in the stock market, still stay pretty cash flush. So interesting to hear if you've heard from those folks about why and if so, they're um, diving back. And if not, this is one of those starting Monday things to really lean into 
segmentation. Who is uh, pulling back? Where do, is it earlier people in their gift cycle with you? Is it folks who are later in their journey? Um, those can all be areas you can dive into and look at. Okay, I'll pause there as folks can put that in the chat and or um, give us just a moment to breathe because it's a lot of information to uh, wrap our heads around as well as uh, deal with the gravity of as we go through this. Okay, so to keep us on track, um, typology here. So segmentation, you saw me look at typology in the tool together. So you can look at different levels of participation and how your levels are comparing to everyone else in the aggregated data set. So we use it to help us think about under, and understanding who's coming with recency, frequency, monetary investment, and growth over time. So it gives us an RFMG model to understand how our patrons are participating. And you heard me talk a bit about this before, but new customers are a way to segment your, your database. You've got within your current customers, people who've been once before, converties twice before, active people three to nine times, super actives 10 pluses. Those active and super actives are probably your subscribers. So this also gives you a model to transcend a specific subscription non versus subscription for single ticket buying, but puts them all into a lens uh, to understand how impactful and dedicated they are, as well as uh, re-engaging folks stale and lapse people haven't been 18 to 36 months or three years or more. So what have we seen in terms of comeback from these different segments? And we're going to look at it from new, current, and uh, lapsed folks um, or re-engaged folks. So this is uh, 2019 versus 2022 for performing arts sectors as a whole, or performing arts industry as a whole in North America. The blue line is 2019, the purple bar is 2022, and what percentage of each of these three categories made up our uh, ticket buying, um, you know, complete pie of revenue that we brought in the door. And you see here, um, in 2022, much more uh, activity coming from first timers. So uh, we're refilling our pipelines, which is great and probably makes sense when we think about all of those younger audiences that we're getting to re-engage and or grow. We're struggling with getting people who come traditionally to keep coming. So current is actually a lower percentage of participation and engaged, we're seeing some lapsed folks. Makes sense if you think 18 to 33 years, that's early on in the pandemic. So those people are now re-engaging back in. So how does this compare uh, to the orchestra sector? So um, some slight differences. New here is about the same in terms of percentage of participation. Uh, current, we're still lacking behind a bit. But look at those re-engaged folks, those people who couldn't come probably because we didn't have performances happening are saying, I want to come back and hear those concerts. So continue to lean into re-engaging those folks, but also that investment on the new side as well as is really beneficial and and paying off there. So just look at how young those audiences are that are coming. So that's an exciting piece of the puzzle. OK, one more thing I just want to share and then open it up for some additional questions. But uh, you know that economic outlook, where are we? Because there has been conversation around the R word. So recession, is it coming? Is it not coming? I was recently in a presentation uh, that shared some of this data. So this is not um, in the benchmark, which is some outside research I wanted to bring into the mix. Um, I took a screenshot of it, so it's a little uh, pixelated here, but you'll see it. But the, the, the idea here is that the prediction is we are indeed heading towards a recession in the second half of 2023. You see here the depths of it in the red. Uh, so Q1 of 2022 started to have one down 1.6% of GDP. Uh, Q2 of 2022 is down. And they're predicting in Q3 of this year that will be down. 3.7%, but that will start to get out of it relatively quickly. So um, we'll still feel some of the effects of it in Q4, but that it'll start to turn itself around again as we get into 2024. So shallow, but there. So something for us to be thinking about as we um, plan and budget and really think about how much we can engage those lapsed donors in particular to try to get back into the fold with us. 
another way to look at it comparatively to other recessions. So uh, each of these blue bars represents the loss in GDP over different ones. So we've got going back to 20, uh, uh, 1991, 2001, the 08, 09, the 2020 recession. So 2023, not as deep again as our historical ones. And the idea is that we will probably come out of it relatively quickly. But again, some interesting data just to round out our thoughts and thinking. So with that in mind, I wanted to open it up to questions or reactions that you all have. How does this data make you feel? Any inspirations for action? If you take that thought of, hey, if I go back to my desk starting Monday, what's perhaps one thing that you might want to engage with on the data? Uh, so feel free to put that into the Q&A. Um, and um, perhaps as people are doing that, Kate, hey, what's, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, you know, as you, you're seeing this data and working with clients on a day-to-day -day basis, what are some of the prep strategies or, uh, you know, what data points that people are trying to, you know, focus in on that will help um, activate some of those strategies and thinking? Yeah. Well, I, I think about where we are in the year, you all. Um, so a number of my clients are coming off really strong years of single ticket sales, um, where we've, I've, uh, I've got one client who just hit record, an orchestra client in the South who just hit a record year of tickets, single ticket sales. Um, and I've got other clients whose single ticket sales are rebounding and coming in line with what they were seeing in many cases pre-pandemic, particularly around uh, some of the stronger programming. So that's a huge pool of people. And let's make sure, I think I would be thinking about how are we leaning into our subscription campaigns and making sure that we're really on top of um, acquisition campaigns, especially with those current and recent single ticket buyers. That's always been a productive lead group for driving subscription acquisition. We're seeing post pandemic, that is the number one place that new subscribers come from. It's from your recent single ticket buyers above and beyond lap subscribers, which, which have also been a historically productive group. So that would be the first thing I'd be taking a look at is who are the single ticket buyers you have? If you still have season left to go, some of you do run into June uh, or even into the summer with your season. So let's make sure we're getting as many of those current single ticket buyers back for a second concert this season. People who've come two or more times are six times more likely to subscribe the following year. So it's a huge, Huge benefit, six times more I'm, likely. I'm putting my sixes up here. Yeah. Right. Indeed. If your season's over, that's fine. You still have a subscription season to sell. So how are you making sure that you've really got strong, strong subscription asks? And when I say strong subscription ask, make sure that you are making really clear in those pieces, your calls to action. Why should I subscribe? Um, making that really big and bold. Uh, in all of your, your marketing campaigns, whether it's mail, email, social, digital. Um, you notice I only mentioned direct marketing channels, y'all. Um, but those would be the things, that would be the first thing I'd be thinking about as we're in this really critical time of year. Um, and then the second one would be single tickets are a huge driver. They are the pipeline to everything. And Eric, what I noticed in that what you showed was new audiences for the performing arts field writ large are 50 to 60% of their ticket buyers. With 50%, 55% pre-pandemic, it's gone up above 60%. If we look at the orchestra sector, pre-pandemic, so 2019, it was only 40%, and it's still only around that 40% mark. So we have a harder time in orchestra attracting new audiences than some of our performing arts disciplines peers. Um, so how are we, as we're writing budgets for next year, as we're thinking about our campaign plans, how are we investing in attracting new audiences into the orchestra? How are we investing in making sure they come back for a second engagement so that we're really preparing fertile soil to, to regrow our organizations? So those are the two things I'd be looking at. How are we doing with multi-buyers and single ticket buying this season? Can we get anybody back? And can we get them to subscribe next season? And then how are we going to plan to attract those new folks next season um, and continue to rebuild our pipelines for the future? Yeah, I love that inspiration. And I wonder, you know, out there, um, 
you, some of you said, yeah, we are seeing younger audiences showing up. Uh, what are some of the strategies or drivers that have done that? Um, or, or what, what strategically have you done that you've seen work? I actually was at midwinter meeting with group five and six orchestras. And um, I did not put this out, idea out there. So I just want to say that because, um, but I, I, I do not judge it. I think it's fabulous, but like leaning into cannabis. So having, you know, concerts that there were some folks who were thinking, hey, what if we have like a, a tasting menu kind of thing, our con matching concerts with edibles. It was a really fascinating, interesting idea to think about growing other things in addition to new audiences. But um, I was I was excited by the, the prospect and it was 420 day yesterday. So um, that's also, you know, what perhaps folks are leaning into that. I'm being a bit, uh, you know, uh, jokey for a purpose, but like things that are help break through the clutter of messaging and uh, position things in different ways. We, of course, always want to have the product to be front and center and foundational to what we're doing, but it does or can take uh, some new wrappers on things to excite new buyers to try to come out and try things. So th those of you who said, hey, we're, we are seeing some new folks, what perhaps are some of those new wrappers? that you're trying or new um, strategies that are, that are resonating that way. I'll see if that um, opens up the chat in any way or, or gets some new folks in there. Let's see, Shannon, you're in your neck of the woods. Shannon's in Minneapolis. I know Minnesota Orchestra just uh, got clearance to add a THC seltzer to their concessions, so. Yes, we have a very unique market for that. So yeah, yeah. Uh, keep, keeping it modern. Mm -hmm. Keeping it modern. That's right. <laughs> um, oh, good. I think we see something in the queue. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Uh, yeah, I'll read. So Casey's questions. I don't. I don't currently have your G benchmark. Uh, and how can we add the module to individual giving account or organization account? <laughs> Yeah, so Casey, um, we can, so you're in the benchmark, I think, yes? I think that's the case. Um, uh, but if, anyway, I'll, I'll get your email address and send you some follow-up information, A, to uh, how you can join, but B, if you're in already, which I think you are, but I'll just confirm that, how to, I'll connect you with our team who can set up logins and access points for anyone on your team. Like I said, um, you could have as many folks at your organization have logins, there's no restriction to it. So uh, marketing, yeah. development, all that kind of good stuff. Anybody who wants to see it can get one, so. Great. It looks like, I mean, while people are thinking about it age-wise, um, some things that I know that my clients are doing that are having success changing some of the demographic uh, profiles of their audience. One is just being really thoughtful about where your marketing is. Um, we often tend to, and what you're saying in that marketing. Um, so we often tend to think of younger audiences, well, I, I gotta go digital, but are you thinking about geography? Um, not everyone in your market, not every zip code in your market is the same and where people live can really impact who comes? So how are you using geotargeting with your digital advertising? How are you using where you are physically advertising in those spaces? It's old school. We all don't like to talk about flyering and postering, but it's still where people go. If I'm, you know, uh, we all joke about millennials and avocado toast, but that means they're going to their coffee shops, to their local blue bottle or wherever it is in your market that they buy the avocado toast. So making sure that we're showing up in the spaces that people are so that they know about our programming. And Eric, I love this phrase about the wrapper. How are we talking about programming? I think that's a, a big place that organizations, particularly orchestras are experimenting with. Um, the, the roster of artists that are household names is not as large as maybe it was when, when I entered the field and certainly not as large as, you know, my boss when I when I was but a green a green little marketer in a year in the in the early aughts um 
my boss who would just reminisce about the 80s when the house would sell out on subscription. Like the, the roster of names is just not the same in terms of household names. So how are we telling people about the experience and making clear for that millennial or Gen Xer who may not have any idea who Natasha Peremsky is as wonderful as she is, um, what kind of music they're gonna hear, what this experience is gonna be like and why it would be a good fit for their lifestyle, for their interests. Um, so those would be some things I would just start thinking about as you look at your marketing. Some of you are in these generations. Don't ignore Gen X. What appeals to people in your generation? And does this piece, if you were not an orchestra head, would you know what this piece is talking to you about? Um, so those would be just some things I would think about. If, if you don't feel like you're growing in that generation or you wanna see even more growth, those would be some some places to play with. Excellent. Well, looking at Tom, I think Kate, that's a great inspiration for us to think about as we uh, get to the top of the hour. And I just want to bring up one additional slide just so you all have it. But like I said, always happy to puzzle through this with you. You'll get this in the follow up. Um, or if you want to, uh, you know, take this down, this, you'll, you'll get my link to my Calendly which is a time you can use to, or you can use Calendly to schedule time on my calendar where we can talk. I'm happy to do a one hour sort of strategy puzzle through session, no obligation for anything else. It's really a choose your own adventure of what topics we cover. So it is time for you and your team. Feel free to invite others from your team to talk through that. So you'll get that information. And then also here's my contact information. I will put it in the chat as well. So you have it. So feel free to um, you know, shoot me an email at any time, especially if you get this deck and you want to share it with other team members and folks say, oh, what, what, what? I want to understand a little bit more about that. How can I, can we dig into that further? Happy to do that with you all. Um, I want to thank so much, Kate and Shannon, for joining today, for all of you, for being out there, for being interested in data. It is exciting to uh, dig into this stuff with you. And then also um, big thank you again to the League of American Orchestras for uh, this long and really uh, powerful partnership together to get the word out and volumize this information that just helps to fuel all of our strategy comebacks and whatnot. So um, thank you all. Uh, you'll probably get follow up in about in the next week or so. And like I said, the recording and this deck will also be posted on the Leeds website. So that's another a uh, great way in their research, um, the research section of the site that's like a great place to find it. So onward and upward, here's two great weekends to you all. And um, thank you all so much. Talk to you soon. And I will end the share. See you Everybody. All. Everybody take care. <laughs>